All right, so welcome everyone to State Chess. Um, I have the honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Dan Weiss as our speaker today. And so Dr. Weiss um, got his undergraduate degree from Cornell and his medical school degree from Mount Sinai. He then went on to do internship at the University of Michigan and then fellowship at um, Washington University. And uh, currently Dr. Weiss is a professor at University of Vermont, where I think his two biggest impacts have really been in mesenchymal stem cells and uh, the other major area that he's done a lot of work with is the extracellular matrix. And, and I think, you know, you know, he's published over 100 papers um, and uh, numerous countless awards and grant funding. But, but I think that I've actually gotten to hear Dr. Weiss speak, and I've always just been impressed by this breadth of his understanding of, of the problem, both on the sort of research mechanistic side and the studies based on how these systems interact with each other, but also on like the clinical side, because I think this is going to be more of a clinical talk about really how are we going to translate stem cell therapies into patients, and, and is this possible, and how can this get both be done? Uh, and so with that introduction, I will let you sort of go ahead and do that yourself. All right, well, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. And uh, I'm ho hoping you can all hear me well enough. All right, good. So it's a real pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the um, invitation to participate. It's good to see a lot of old familiar faces and friends and collaborators and colleagues and me and everybody else uh, here. Um, so what I want to do is uh, take you on a ride, all right, because this is a great time to be in regenerative medicine, and particularly for uh, pulmonary disease and critical illnesses. So uh, the title is as such, and the way I look at regenerative medicine, just so you have nothing to, uh, uh, in terms of conflicts. So what, what's our goal? Uh, so we have uh, broken down, destroyed epithelium of the slum, and what we want to do, get the mouse to work, but what we want to do is uh, get it back to both a normal structure and a normal function. And so what we want to do is both structural repair as well as functional repair. And better still, we can do this in situ. But if we can't, uh, what can we do to try and make that work? So the way I view regenerative medicine, right, uh, is we want to engineer new tissues and new organs, right? So one way of thinking about this is, can you simulate the body's own endogenous repair mechanisms to do things that it normally isn't particularly good at? So for example, if you get a cut in your skin, then that's going to heal generally, right? If you get a cut in your brain, so to speak, that doesn't necessarily heal as well. So if we can figure out how to stimulate the uh, uh, repair mechanisms, then that will be a good way to go. All right, uh, if you can't do that, then can we grow tissues and organs outside of the body uh, for implantation? We'll talk a bit about that. Uh, and then uh, there has been success in simpler tissues like, uh, and I say simpler respectively, uh, skin, bone, cartilage, um, if you're uh, working in those areas, they're not simple tissues, but they're not as complicated as lung, brain, et cetera. Um, and then the other is to uh, develop organ tissue adjunct devices, right? So if you think about it, um, the first uh, real adjunct device was dialysis, right? Around World War I, uh, when this was invented. And there are left ventricular assist devices for a uh, failing heart bridge transplant. We don't have as much uh, out there for lung. And so this is a target area, and we'll talk a little bit about this. But um, for fun, right? Who was, we're, we're catching up with uh, ancient history. Who was the first regenerative medicine scientist? All right, I'm gonna pick on Sam in the audience, right here, okay? She, very important, she wrote a genre-changing book in the 1800s. I have no idea. Oh, come on. <laughs> Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley, first, Mary Mary Shelley. Shelley. Right, so we're all playing catch up right now. <laughs> so just to give you a, a sense of what I do in my lab, so um, you know, my target is how do you fix a broken lung? So we use a lot of different uh, approaches, image approaches. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, various stem and progenitor cells, including uh, IPSC, induced purple stem cells. We do a lot of work with uh, cell therapies, and this is the MSC. Uh, based cell therapy approaches. I'm going to talk about this at length tomorrow in the uh, research group meeting. Uh, and then there are other things happening. I'm going to take long slice. Uh, but we do a lot of work with engineering approaches, uh, hydrogels and the like. And we show you how this scientific approach can lead towards potential clinical translation 
And we've developed a couple of novel devices along the way that I think are really of uh, interest and potential clinical use as well. So if you want to engineer a new lung, what's your uh, minimal gas uh, exchange requirements? That's it. You need something that's going to do gas exchange. All right. Better still if it has a filtration function. Uh, better still if it has all these other attributes, uh, long life cycle, light, airway epithelial cells, severe epithelial cells. Uh, immune compatibility, uh, the various immune and inflammatory functions of the lung. Uh, but at the end of the day, you want gas exchange. Now, the challenge is the lung is not a liver, right? The lung has a very complicated macro and micro structure function relationship. So you see here the macro structure, which is physiologically critical, right? Uh, and then the microstructure. This is an old slide from Barry Scrit, uh, showing that at the time there were at least 40 different cells that had been identified in the lung. Now, with all the RNA seq work and the like, uh, it seems like there's a new cell uh, every couple of weeks or so. And so, this is uh, something that needs to be taken into account on um, growing new lungs outside of the body. So, what, what kind of approaches are out there? Um, I'm not going to talk that much about precision cut lung slices. It's a very powerful tool, one of which uh, is very prominent here, and there's some really excellent work going on. And the like, uh, but just for uh, those not as up to speed, what was what were the PCLS originally invented for? Not invented, uh, utilized for airway smooth muscle. Airway smooth muscle, exactly right. So it's a tool for looking at bronchodilators, right, and developing new pharmaceutics. Um, and so the PTLS um, is uh, powerful. It, it has a limited lifespan still, which limits what you can do. But as I learned today, <laughs> there's some really incredible uh, cell and molecular work that is being going on, particularly with respect to trying to understand not pulmonary um, bronchial airway diseases, but pulmonary fibrosis and other things. So that's very good. Lung on chip. Um, so I, I wasn't sure, actually, we didn't talk about that as much. Is anybody here doing? Organomic chip type work. All right, anyway, so the idea being uh, you can create a small chamber uh, with a membrane on which you put airway or lung epithelial cells on one side uh, and uh, pulmonary vascular capillary epithelial cells on the other side, and you can ventilate, you can perfuse these chambers and learn a lot about cell biology. And again, it's a pharmaceutical uh, testing device, but no one's going to grow a lung from a lung on a chip, if you will, at least not yet. But you can do nasty things like uh, expose the lung on a chip to cigarette smoke and use these as a model system. So these are very powerful tools, uh, as is 3D printing. All right, so 3D printing, 3D bioprinting actually has been out there for a while. And you can see you can 3D print ears and noses and things like that. Um, and so where 3D printing has made impact so far in the rest of the world is in airways, so trachea and major bronchi. And so uh, this is a picture of an actual 3D printed construct uh, at the University of Michigan that was surgically implanted into a new neonate with a congenital disease. Now tracheal diseases aren't as common, right, as the respiratory spectrum diseases we deal with. So uh, congenital defects, trauma, um, cancer, and the like. Uh, but this is something that can work. Now, this is a material that is a biomaterial, biocompatible material, polyalactone or whatever. Um, so this is good. This is save the baby's life. But what's the problem here? Baby grows. The baby grows. And this doesn't grow. So we need to be better in terms of biomaterials. And the whole field of tracheal engineering uh, has been out there for us. It's been rocked by scandal. Uh, if you will, so anybody saw a bad doctor on Netflix. Um, but anyway, uh, science marches on. So what about 3D printing along? Um, so this is actually happening. So uh, bio, excuse me, um, United Therapeutics has a facility in Manchester, New Hampshire. Some of you may be aware of this. And they have 3D printed full-size lungs with uh, airways and vascular channels and like. But um, it's it's got a ways to go. But maybe down in the future, this will be a viable way, right? <laughs> but if you want to uh, move away to uh, where most progress has been made and you look at um, ex vivo engineering for lungs, um, you want to see if you can grow functional gas exchange tissue outside uh, the body in the lab. And so you need a scaffold to start with, right? So here's your erector set. 
And then ideally, uh, if you add organ specific cells from individual patients, right, then you're tailor making the ultimate in personalized medicine. And what's the goal? This is lung transplant, right? So it increases the supply. Uh, and it also decreases the acute and chronic rejection if you have an autologous construct to implant into somebody. So um, what has been done and studied most of all uh, is DNA decelerization. Now this is the home of Laura Nichols, who is one of the pioneers in this field. So she's been doing this, we've been doing this, uh, other groups have been doing this uh, for a while and it made a lot of progress. So the idea being is you can take a lung, uh, Treated with detergents, hypotonic solutions, hypotonic solutions, and the like, and remove all the cells. And you're left with the macro structure of a lung and put it in bioreactors and uh, see what you can do with it in terms of growing again, function of new tissue for potential implantation, transplantation. So, uh, just to show you this, what we've been able to do here is uh, human lung. Well, we get our lungs, we don't have a transplant program. In Vermont, so we get, I get my lungs from autopsy and like it. So here's an autopsy lung uh, that is through the sequential detergents, triton, sodium dioxycholate, et cetera. And you can see how it ends up being this um, whitish tissue that we can endoscope, bronchoscope, and show the macro structure. And then we also can use various imaging modalities to look at the microstructure. Here's a decelerated mouse lung. The trachea is cannulated. You can see the uh, scale bar. Here's the heart right there. And by light microscopy, electron microscopy, trachea, proximal distal areas, alveoli, you maintain uh, by and large the micro anatomy, if you will. We can cannulate the pulmonary artery and shoot some dyes to have the blue going in uh, and then coming out the pulmonary vein on the other side. And we can use our bioreactors, which is a complex field all by itself to uh, keep the lungs uh, alive. Um, but the question is, how long can you keep the lungs alive, right? So if you think about transplant, right? How much time do you have from the donor to the recipient before the lung goes bad? Oh, you guys know this, eight to 12 hours, right? All right, so if you're trying to grow a new lung in a bioreactor, it can take weeks, right? So how do you keep that alive? It's a, it's a real challenge in terms of technology. All right, so but these are the types of things we can do with it. And again, you've seen this for years uh, with Laura and Laura's group. But here's an example of work we did with Daryl Cotton at Boston University. And these are embryonic stem cells from a transgenic mouse in which uh, the green fluorescent protein, GFP, is linked with surfactant uh, C expression. So when you see uh, any green, these are mice that are beginning to express surfactant. And you can separate them out by back sorting with flow cytometry and put them into a decelerized lung. So here's a photomicrograph of a decelerized mouse lung. And you can see on the higher power view that uh, there's been very good alveolar and airway coverage uh, with these embryonic stem cells, right? Um, that have at least run to different entry towards lung cells. Uh, but then we do more in-depth look. Uh, here's immunohistochemistry, human alpha, and the morphology suggestive of a type one cell. So again, by just putting the cells into a matrix environment, the matrix somehow, we're just gonna be EPP uh, today, directs the cells to differentiate along what you hope, think you would like them to do. So DN recellerization, not the flavor, but um, there are a lot of things to think about. So D cell, uh, how do you do it? Um, how do you characterize what's left over? So a lot of mass spectrometry, protein analyses, things like that. Uh, and then you have to put the cells back in. And again, uh, ideally these are autologous cells from the eventual transplant recipient, but you've got 40 different cell types, right? So how do you mix and match? What order, what combination, what growth media, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then where we put a lot of time into is uh, the environmental influences. So um, what, for example, PAO2, what stretch the lungs are doing this. So we have the experimental systems that can impose cyclic mechanical strain in which we can uh, tune this frequency and amplitude and things like that. And then you want to put it in uh, to the lung. So uh, there's been a lot of progress made. We've done a lot of work with uh, United Therapeutics, another co uh, company, 
Uh, because even if we can figure out how to do this with human lungs, there still won't be enough to go around, right? There are only so many autopsy lungs and so many failed donor lungs that could be re, excuse me, D and then re-solarized. So um, you've seen in the news uh, just like two weeks ago, the uh, pig, that, the pig kidney that got transplanted. And then last year, there were two pig hearts that got transplanted into a patient's so like, So these are from transgenic pigs that have major immune epitopes um, uh, deleted out, if you will. So there's less immunosuppression necessary. So um, can you do this with lung? No one has really gotten to that point because the lung is very complicated and has lots of immune epitopes, including the fact that the kidneys and the hearts generally don't have a lot of immune cells like macrophages, where the lungs will have a lot of immune cells, right? So the idea here is that you can uh, <coughs> decelerize a pig lung which is anatomically not that far away from a human lung. It's close enough, right? And then re-cellarize with um, human lung cells. And so this has been a uh, significant amount of work with United Therapeutics. So just to give you an idea of the types of things we can do, here's a wild type and then uh, a gene-edited uh, alpha galactosyl alpha transferase knockout pig. And we can decelerize them and then we can re-cellarize them with a variety of human lung cells, and it looks pretty good. So uh, we'll see where this goes and the like. But that's this is all old news, right? This is Dean Resell's been around for a long time. Where we've taken this is, I think, really exciting directions. So the uh, D cell turns out, D cell lung turns out to be an incredible tool for studying lung biology, right? Um, and in part because you, if you look at the macro structure, you have the uh, 3D organization of Airways, vasculature, of the like they're <clears throat> maintaining to some degree the mechanical properties of the native lung. Now that's not uh, completely the same as the native lung, but you can use these to study. But then what you can do is look more into the weeds, all right, uh, and look at the composition of the extracellular matrix. And the whole idea here is that the matrix rules everything. All right, this is a. Uh, uh, let me actually highlight Darcy Wagner was a very talented postdoc in the lab who's now the um, uh, Canadian Excellence and Research Chair in Lung Regenerative Medicine at McGill. So she's done very well. Uh, Jeanette Burgess is a lung biologist in uh, Rottingen University in, in uh, Netherlands. And we do a lot of work together with Matrix. But the whole point being is that cells live on Matrix. All right. And Matrix has characteristic properties that you need to interrogate. One is the composition, what's the matrix made of? Remember, the second is what is the stiffness of the matrix? Stiffness plays a very significant effect on cell behaviors. And then the third is if you have a dynamic tissue like lung, which is doing this, uh, what are the effects of cyclical mechanical strain and stretch? So there's a fair amount known um, on fibroblasts, uh, less so for lung epithelial cells. And so here's just a schematic, uh, Dan Schumperlin, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, uh, it has been pioneering uh, this for a long time. But cells behave differently and adopt different uh, phenotypes, uh, depending on the simply on the stiffness of the surface that they live on. So we've been looking at this and uh, developing a new set of investigative tools for this, so you can get the whole lung piece of our scaffolds. But then you realize the lung again, it's not liver, and I'm not demeaning liver. <laughs> by any means, but lung is very complicated. And so you have, for example, different extracellular matrix components depending on what region of the lung. So the large ves uh, airways vessels are different than the small airways and vessels are different from the alveoli in terms of the proteins and other things that make up the extracellular matrix. Plus you also have different uh, regional specific mechanical properties like stiffness. And so you can use things like atomic force microscopy to look at stiffness and regional differences in stiffness. So what does this mean? So here's a photomicrograph of a normal lung and a lung of a COPD patient after decelerization. And there's difference in collagen architecture. Now this is new news. People know this for a long time. But what we've been able to do is do a detailed mass spectrometry on decelerized lungs. And if you look here, this is a busy slide. Uh, but in terms of the bar graph, we have non-disease, COPD, and IPF lungs, and we do mass spectrometry 
and you can see the different ECM protein categories, and then pick a couple uh, to highlight in particular, like fibrillin 1 and collagen 3, collagen 6, and like there are substantive differences in the ECM content of these different regions, excuse me, of these uh, lungs from different patient origins. And what does that mean realistically? So here's going back to recellerizing the decellerized lung. Um, these two photo micrographs from the lower left hand corner are a normal lung from a lifelong non smoker we got from autopsy. Decellerized, we put human bronchial epithelial cells, these HVs, into it. And uh, you can see that the cells are very happily adhering, uh, interacting with the matrix, and they're still there and going good by three weeks later in this particular experiment. In complete contrast, if you look at an emphysemous lung, decelerated lung, you can see that the vast majority of cells are rounding up. They're not uh, sticking to the matrix. They're not interacting with the matrix. And they're gone uh, you know, several days later. So there's something fundamentally different about a matrix from a COPD patient that is impairing normal cell behavior. And so you can see how this would be something that you could pursue that it's in very normal repair uh, after the development of emphysema after exposure to cigarette smoke and, and the like. So what do we go with this? So what other tools can we develop? And so this is work done with a, another uh, former postdoc, Robert Pouliot, and a very good collaborator at Virginia Commonwealth University, Rebecca Heisey. And so what we've been able to do is to take the decel lungs, decelerize them, grind them up, middle them, lyophilize them, digest them, and we make hydrogels uh, for use in cell culture, organoid culture. Does, who, who here does organoid culture? Right, so uh, what, what, what do you use for your matrix? Matrix gel. And is that good? So the answer was matrix gel. All right, so what, what's matrix gel made of? It's like, uh... I think it's tumor derived, it's cancer derived exercise. It's a mouse sarcoma. Yeah. All right. So, how relevant is that for lung? It's terrible. There you go. Okay. So, <laughs> what we've done is develop a series of tools in which we create hydrogels for use in organoid cultures and other studies right from the lung itself. Okay. And the beauty of this is we can do this from normal to get producing some normal lungs, but also from disease lungs. All right. And then we can do, and this is a very busy slide, but I just want to highlight a couple things. We can actually take this a step further, and uh, you know, a lot of undergraduates come through the lab, and so uh, we, we get them to uh, sit down under the sterile hood and take the decelerized lung and dissect out the airways, dissect out the vasculature, dissect out the alveolar enriched region, so the parenchyma. And uh, what we then do is create hydrogels out of those. So we have not just normal and diseased lungs, we have anatomic compartments uh, from normal and diseased lungs. And we can do uh, mass spectrometry, for example, and you can see how uh, here is whole lung, vascular, alveolar airway uh, ECM proteins. Uh, this is a PCA analysis, showing that they cluster very nicely. So there are distinct differences in the protein, concentrate, uh, protein content, excuse me, depending on the region. That makes sense, I mean, airways, are cartilaginous, so if they're going to have a different set of proteins and non cartilaginous distal areas and albeit and all that. But we can categorize this, and again, here's a heat map showing the differences um, in all types of bar graphs, highlighting individual proteins. The message here is not to absorb all that data, but to understand that there are distinct statistically and presumably biologically and clinically important differences in the extracellular matrix proteins depending on the region of the lung, depending on if it's a normal or a disease lung on top of that. The other thing we look at are uh, the glycosamino aminoglycans, the GAGs. All right, so these are another component of the extracellular matrix. And they're important because GAGs are a site for the binding and the interaction of matrix-associated growth factors. So things like TGF beta, things like uh, hepatocyte growth factor, things like fibroblast uh, growth factor. And so um, they're less well studied in terms of lung biology, but they're critically important. And so if we do the same types of analyses and, and we work with a group at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute um, who do our gag analyses uh, with us, you can see here, 
Uh, for example, if you look at total GAGs, uh, that there are profound differences. Um, and again, the color scheme here is green is a non-smoker, normal long COPD is blue, IPF is red. So uh, it, it's right in front of your eyes that there are profound differences in GAG content. Uh, and we can also, and I'm not showing this, uh, have similar observations for individual GAG components. So things like heparan sulfate, chondroitin sulfate, hyaluronic acid, et cetera. And we can also break this down even further into the uh, disaccharide composition, the side chains of the GAGs, which are what the uh, matrix associated growth factors actually interact with. And again, it's a busy slide, but the point being is that um, normal COPD IPF, there are some really substantive differences uh, in the GAG disaccharide groupings, particularly in IPF alone. So what does that mean functionally? So you can do something called a surface plasma resonance uh, assay, and we don't do this, again, the collaborators at Rensselaer Polytech do this, but the idea being is you can determine how well any given growth factor binds to any given GAG. And so, for example, we look at fibroblast uh, last growth factor two interacting with chondroitin sulfate, and the IG, uh, normal COPD and uh, IPF. And the devil's in the details, but if you just look at the distribution of the different colored lines, uh, they're different between the three lungs. And so, uh, what does this mean? Uh, at the end of the day, IPF lungs are less able to bind growth factors. All right, in, um, in the matrix. And so what does that mean for pathogenesis and potential uh, therapeutics? And you can do uh, experiments like this. And again, another busy slide, but it, it purposely, Franz Ewell is another uh, great postdoc who did a lot of work. So if you take gels and you put cells back into the gels, and then you add in a combinatorial fashion, uh, different uh, growth factors and different uh, of GAGs, and you look at a pulmonary vascular endothelial cell line, those human bronchial epithelial cells, HBEs, and the HLF human lung fibroblasts, uh, there are really substantive differences. Just look at this one right here. Depending on the growth factor in the GAG, you have that. So that says you can go back to your decellarized lungs, you can go back to your lung derived hydrogen gels, and ask questions about. Uh, in a combinatorial way about what gags or growth factors or combinations are important, and that can help again drive potential therapeutics. So, um, what do you, where, what kind of really interesting things can you do with this? So, we've been studying, amongst other things, uh, the ability of type 2 alveolar epithelial cells to differentiate into type 1 cells. Now, type 2 cells make sure back, and that's their major function. But they also have the capacity to, when necessary, uh, differentiate and replenish damaged uh, AT1s. Um, is that a significant pathogenesis in IPF? Absolutely. Is it pathogenesis in other disease? Likely. So um, the primary AT2s and AT1s can be problematic, difficult to culture and all that. Uh, it's doable. But we have ended, ended up working in large part with uh, AT2s derived from induced pluripotent stem cells that, again, we get from uh, Darrell Cotton and Boston University. And <clears throat> we asked the question as well, what happens if we put these IAT2s into a lung-derived hydrogel as opposed to a nature gel? And we can characterize further the uh, hydrogels here. We can tune the stiffness. This is uh, Pascal's as a measure of stiffness on the y-axis and different concentrations of the lung hydrogel. We can do, again, mass spec, and we know exactly what proteins are in these hydrogels, which gives us, if we see something, then we have targets to either augment or downregulate if you will, see what's necessary and sufficient in terms of protein. And so this is uh, work from a, a very talented grad student at Hoffman who's now doing a postdoc with uh, Mike Beers at uh, Penn University of Pennsylvania. And so the idea being is that the uh, 82-day one differentiation mechanisms, not well understood, um, difficult to say primary cells, et cetera, right? So here's the schematic. You take the uh, IPSC draft cells, put them into the hydrogel, and come back later and look at uh, just general growth characteristics, gene expression, morphology, and the like. So what do you see? So this is really fascinating that if you put 
the uh, type two cells, the IP two cells, into a lung major drill, this is an alveolar major drill. And one other thing to explain about these uh, IP twos is that they have a cherry red reporter link with SPC expression. So if the cells are making surfactant protein C, then they'll turn red. So here are clusters of SPC producing cells um, in the alveolar ECM uh, to start uh, uh, at day four. Uh, and what we start seeing are these ring-like cells, all right? Uh, and we do not see this in this higher power of use. Uh, cells uh, that have a morphology suggestive of, of a type one cell, all right? And they begin to lose these tomato red uh, expression, so they're not producing surfactant over time. And we absolutely do not see this in cells cultured in major gear. This is a specific phenomenon of the cells in the alveolar hydrogel. And we also had to tune the stiffness. So here's a PCA uh, analysis of gene expression. I'll show you that in a second. Major gel, eight milligram per mil alveolar hydrogel, 30 milligrams per mil. Uh, we can tune stiffness simply by changing the protein concentration. That's a very easy way to go. There are other ways of doing it. But uh, but when we run uh, RNAC on this, uh, you can see that here is eight milligrams per mil alveolar hydrogel, 30 milligrams per mil alveolar hydrogel compared to matrix, excuse me, compared to uh, matrix gel. And you can see on these gene expression plots, there are all the red dots are upregulated genes. And there are a lot of them that are relevant for type one alveolar cells, but also that. Uh, newly recognized or relatively newly recognized intermediate transitional cells. So simply by putting the type two cells into a ECM composition that is more like home, um, they start spontaneously, uh, use the word deliberately, turning into transitional cell intermediates and then type one cell. So this is really interesting and it gives us a lot of, uh, I think, experimental power to ask a lot of really interesting mechanisms of questions. So one of the <laughs> questions is, um, what happens if we put the cells in a disease hydrogen? All right, so again, this is work with uh, Jeanette Burgess and some of her uh, grad students, then it's an undergrad on that. And uh, we developed uh, one of many hypotheses for IPF uh, pathogenesis, and this is that there's deranged crosstalk between the type two cell and the uh, fibroblast, right? Mm -hmm. Not a novel idea, of course, but um, what we think is mechanistically is that uh, something makes the type two cells make more TGF beta two, okay? Not beta one, but beta two. And this turns, the, the, tells the fibroblast to uh, proliferate and secrete more fiber, uh, collagen. And the fibroblast then secrete um, spark, uh, secreted protein, acidic rich and cysteine, uh, which then feeds back on the type two cells and tells them to stop turning into type one cells. Okay, all right, so uh, this is uh, what we see. And then the data we've gotten so far is that uh, very intriguing. If you put these uh, induced for protein stem cell derived type two cells in a normal matrix, a healthy alveolar matrix, and we're looking at PCR uh, as a means of gene expression, then uh, we're not seeing anything in the healthy, but in the IPF, there's a significant upregulation of TGF-2. And then comparably, if we put the fibroblast in an IPF gel compared to a normal gel, we're getting more spark. All right, so again, this gives us, uh, takes us out of the descriptive type studies with the hydrogels into mechanistic questions that we need using these tools. So really exciting stuff. Um, what else can we do with these? So uh, working with a uh, very talented young faculty at uh, Carnegie Mellon, Char uh, Charlie Rand, he's um, created an inside out organoid. So when you put airway epithelial cells into organoid culture, by and large, they tend to have the uh, inverse polarity than what you want with the uh, apical side and the cilia on the inside of the sphere and the basal uh, portion of the cell on the outside. And that's not what you want because you want the apical side to interact with the surrounding environment. And so 
uh, try to figure out how to do the uh, inside out, but he had nothing in, in the middle. And so we uh, said, well, let's put some matrix in the middle because that's what the basal side of the cell is sitting on, right? Basal membrane, collagen, four, whatever. And so you can see here by immunostaining um, that uh, without the matrix on the inside, you get a certain set of uh, genes, uh, cells based on uh, immunophenotyping. Uh, and if you look at matrix inside, you get a completely different set of cells. All right, so simply by having the matrix, um, you're changing the behavior of the uh, long epithelial cells in this type of culture. Um, we've been working with uh, Andy Ryan at Iowa, who many of you may know, a very talented long epithelial biologist. Um, and we simply took primary human area epithelial cells put them on a normal matrix or a collagen matrix or a matrix derived from not IPF, but COPD, decelerized lungs. And you can see that there's a whopping increase in the number of goblin cells, producing, producing goblin cells. So you think about the pathogenesis of chronic bronchitis, right? And the matrix is driving that, all right? So again, we have to figure out what is going on with the matrix and what we can do about it. So that's um, a, a sampling of some of the work we've been doing uh, with cell matrix interactions. But I want to go off on uh, two tangents, uh, particularly for all the fellows and the uh, young investigators coming up, because this is where biology and lung physiology is a lot of fun. So when we were doing, now we're back to decelerization. And when you decelerize mouse lungs or rat lungs, uh, you can do high throughput. You can get lots of mice, right? But if you get a human lung or a pig lung, that's a big thing, and you can't do high throughput on a big lung. So we had developed a technique for carving out little baby lungs, if you will. So about thumb-sized chunks of a decelerized lung. And as long as you could identify a cannulatal bronchovascular bundle, so airway and uh, blood vessel, then you could cannulate, and you have a little lung that you could perfuse and ventilate, and you could get 10, 20, 50 of these out of a, a lobe, if you will. The problem being, and it's what that allowed was high throughput. So we could study all those different questions of recellerization. What a cell, what media, what combination of cells, et cetera, in a human lung with human cells. But the problem being is when you do that, you lose the fur. And so these are little sponges that everything you inoculated into them just leaked right out. So we had to come up with an artificial pleura. And so we went through a lot of different materials and uh, things like agar agarose and silicone, liquid latex and all that. And you need something that's biocompatible, adheres to the scaffold, uh, stable, uh, retains cells, not toxic, et cetera, all of those things. So we finally uh, figured out that alginate, so seaweed-derived alginate uh, could be a good material. And alginate is, uh, as listed, safe, non-toxic, uh, it's out there already in food, cosmetics, uh, other biomedical applications, actually wound care, implants and all that. So what we're able to do is take alginate, which is generally stiff, and if you chemically modify it by methacrylation, simple chemical reaction, then it's this stretchable thing, right? So we were able actually to take the decelerized baby lung chunks and dip them in this uh, alginate solution. We had a, a plural coating, or at least a covering, that allows us to do all these experiments we wanted to do with perfusing and ventilating and all that. But then we realized there was, um, again, I didn't start out to do this, but it's one of these things you just strikes you one day. And like, uh, that there was, a, we had maybe a, a, a immediate clinically relevant product. And so the the target here is uh, bronchochlorofficial, right? So in these uh, you know fairly gory pictures, and all right, um, lots of ways to get holes and lacerations in the lung, and we can all put in chest tubes, right, and evacuate the air from the pleural cavity. But you have to fix the underlying defect, right? So what's out there right now? Maybe you have an idea. The fiber and glues don't work, right? Um, Cyanoacrylate super glue, it's been tried, that doesn't work. So the only thing out there right now is something called Progel. So do you guys have uh, any experience with Progel? All right, so Progel is used by the cardiothoracic surgeons for uh, low, low bar resection or pneumonectomy 
And what progel is, uh, is polyethylene glycol. It's like coffee in your bathroom, right? It's like polyethylene glycol in one syringe and uh, human serum albumin in another syringe. Press down on the plunger, they mix and they gunk up into this thing. And so what's used um, and what it's approved for is uh, post-resection to augment surgical repair, if you will. So you, you take out a load, you want to tie off the airway, um, and it's used as an adjunct. It's not approved for anything else. It's contraindicated in pregnancy, it's in uh, people with uh, renal disease, kidney disease, uh, allergies. It's not studied in pregnancy. It's not approved in pediatrics and all that. So there's a huge unmet need for something else, plural, plural, plural sealant. So we said, well, we've got this option, this stuff. Um, how about that? And so you know, here's a schematic of a long collapse repair uh, and all these surgical sealants, et cetera, that are not effective. So we went back to uh, nature, said we make even a better mousetrap. And it turns out that muscles, the shellfish muscles, you know, they've got those uh, fibrinous tendrils on one end, and they are uh, what allow the muscle to adhere to rock surfaces, not get washed away by the tide. So it turns out, you just blow this up, the main adherent compo component of muscle tendril is dopamine, of all things. Right, and so muscle-derived uh, tissue sealants are being increasingly investigated in a range of uh, tissue sealants. But we said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we take our methacrylated alginate, which is stretchy, and uh, conjugate with dopamine? We've got this ready-made long band. All right, so uh, it works. So here's uh, a rat thoracotomy, uh, and we put a hole put the sealant on, we pre-make these little band-aids. And you can see by looking at pressure volume loops, non-injured, injured, sealed. So it's pretty straightforward. And uh, these are, uh, we've done a lot of pigs, a lot more pigs now. Here's a pig thoracotomy. Uh, here's the hole right there, here's the patch. And we can uh, do fluoroscopy and ultrasound and, and uh, so efficacy. <coughs> the DOD has uh, been very generous to us. And we just, um, got another $4 million grant to take this to uh, IND development. We've had our first meeting with the FDA and they're very happy with this. So again, this is a, an idea. I didn't start out to make a new uh, BPF cure, uh, but it was just a sideline idea one day from all the other stuff we were doing. So um, just keep an open mind. So the last thing I want to leave you with is uh, going back to uh, regenerative medicine, right? So convince the lung to re um, repair itself. Make a uh, adjunct, uh, make a, excuse me, a grow a new lung outside of the body. But what about adjunct device? What about hemodialysis or uh, LVAD for the lung, right? Uh, we got ECMO, right? You all have done ECMO or you've seen ECMO, right? And so ECMO is horrendous. Well, it's complicated. Uh, it has problems. You need specialty centers. You need specially trained people. It's expensive. And uh, you know, pre COVID, uh, it wasn't necessarily all that efficacious in adults, uh, pediatrics certainly, but um, it's a different world now. But uh, can we do better than that? And so there are a couple lung assist devices out there, but none of them really, and there's a uh, device that scrubs CO2 that you may have seen, but there really is a need for a, a walkie-talkie um, lung assist device. So we said, well, why don't we have some fun and go back to nature and look at birds? So how do birds breathe? We have an idea. I mean, it's up there for you, right? So the way a bird breathes, if you follow the pictures, follow the yellow. So the yellow goes in to those, what are uh, called posterior air sacs, right? And then the air is blown, well, uh, blown through the lung, all right, in, into the posterior air sacs, and then out the trachea to the exhale. Now, the lung, bird lungs are not like mammalian lungs. Mammalian lungs ventilate. Bird lungs are static little wafer units. They do not ventilate. Okay, so the way this works on the right hand side of that schematic is that air is blown unidirectionally. Blood is perpendicular. It's a cross current. It's not counter curve like the kidney. It's a cross current. And it's essentially 100% efficient in gas stream. Now, mammalian lungs are pretty good. But you don't get dead space, right? There's no dead space in a bird lung, right? So the idea being is that 
Um, you know, birds migrate, some birds migrate thousands of miles, and it's, uh, yeah, they have wings, but it's their respiratory system, right? And there's something called the Himalayan snow goose that can fly over the top of Everest. Um, it's its respiratory system, right? So uh, we said, well, why don't we decellerize bird lungs and recellerize with human lung cells? And so we do this with chicken and with emu. They can actually, there are a couple of emu farms in New Hampshire that we get lungs from periodically. And so here's a chicken lung. This is, this is an emu lung. It's a totally alien looking creature, right? Uh, but we can decelerize the lungs, just like the mammalian lungs. And then here is a four micrograph of a decelerized chicken lung. And all these little blue dots are human lung cells, very happy growing in a decelerized chicken lung. Okay? And then when you take a step back and you say, well, what's in the matrix? Uh, there's a lot of conservation, particularly in major proteins like collagens and uh, elastin, laminin, what have you. So we said, well, why don't we come up with the uh, Canadian lung assist device, the ALAD, right? And so what you see here is a decelerized chicken lung, recelerized with human lung cells in a little plexiglass box with all types of pumps and warmers and humidifiers and all that stuff. And the idea would be to put this in a uh, circuit uh, with the blood vessel, right? And we have three, envision three types, right? One is the big one, that would be an alternative to ECMO in the ICU. The second is the backpack, all right? The portable version, which is comparable to uh, LVAD in a sense, right? And this would be a bridge to transplant, but also realistically, uh, you know, there's some uh, end stage patients who are never gonna qualify for a transplant. And so this would be a quality of life uh, type of thing. And then the third is the implantable, all right? The little one, and so, that is not replacing the lung. These things don't ventilate, but you would implant it with whatever pump and what have you, and have it uh, in, uh, in sequence of circulation with the whole idea of uh, oxygenating uh, and uh, CO2 removal. So, uh, so again, I didn't start out doing this, but you know, it's an idea that came out of everything else. Um, it's a great one to get IP on also too, and like so. I'm waiting for some company to come buy me out on this and the like. So anyway, uh, so that, let me uh, end up. So uh, ex vivo organ en engineering, we've got all these different approaches to try it. Uh, each has uh, merits uh, and a lot of things we can learn. And there's still a lot of challenges. You know, what materials should we be using? Cellularization of a decelerized construct, uh, et cetera, manufacturing. So we can do this uh, in the lab. You want it out there, you've got to figure out how to make this uh, commercializable, manufacturable, so that people, not just the US, but globally, can take advantage of this type of technology. So with that, I think the future is bright. And I want to put in one plug for a conference we hold every other summer. Some of you have been at this conference. Stem cell, cell therapy, bioengineering, lung biology, and diseases. Uh, this is a great conference and it brings in really everybody. And 20, it's every other summer, so July 25 will be the 20th anniversary. So it's going to really make a big deal. And I would love to have anyone and everyone uh, participate in that. So, with that, um, there are lots and lots of people to thank. I've been very fortunate to have uh, it's my current lab, uh, and then lots and lots of people in the past and the like. Uh, we've been very fortunate uh, with funding. And hopefully that'll continue and then internally, but lots and lots of external collaborations. This is only a partial list. Um, my view of science uh, is a jigsaw puzzle. And so the idea being is you, you do your part, you collaborate, you connect dots and uh, things get done and the like. So with that, um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Uh, very happy to uh, answer uh, questions. So thank you. Right, so I'll open up for questions. Thank you for it. Thank you for an amazing talk. It's just mind-boggling and amazing in many ways. Wow, well, coming from, from, from Yale, Yale, that's pretty nice, actually. So um, the patches, uh, you know. Yes. It seems like surgeons, you know, I'm a pathologist. I see what surgeons send down for lung resections. And it's got staples every which way, and they're all leaking. 
yeah. the airways leak. So rather than just you know think about that, couldn't it be just used for just so the two questions? One is you know, used for more routine surgery, it seems like that'd be a huge use. And the second is just the biocompatibility uh, of all this. And you know, how long does it stay on? Does it fall off? Does it, yeah. things grow into it? Like what's the long-term compatibility of that? You were on the FDA panel. I can I can see that. So uh, so basically it's it's uh it's algin and adding the metac relations, chemically modifying it and adding dopamine does have to change the biocompatibility. So we've done a lot of cell culture work and uh it seems like it's not cytotoxic. And so number one, number two, um it degrades over time. And we've done ex vivo degradation studies and that's for example, with the rats, uh, we've taken them out for a year right now. And we also, I'm going to expand this a little bit. We do pleural injury. But we also do tracheal injury because it turns out these patches are good for major, large areas, right? So we'll, we'll cut out a piece of trachea, put a patch on. Sometimes we find them, sometimes we don't. And so, uh, but what we don't see uh, is a significant tissue reaction or inflammatory reaction. So we think that even if they don't degrade, enough over time, then we're fine, right? And so I think that's good. Did, what, uh, sorry, what was your other question? Uh, the question was compatibility. Yeah, yeah, that, so compatible. and, and, and the use for things other than, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. Right, so, 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 again, yeah. regular surgery, because they're putting on these million and a half staples in, which frequently leak. So, so again, I mean, we, we had, we envisioned this for uh, PPS, bronchopleural fistulas, yeah. right, because that's an unmet need, yeah. uh, but it, anything goes. And so, you know, post lobectomy or whatever, Stapley, this is good for that. It would replace or be an alternative to the the progel. But think beyond the lung, beyond the airways, right? So we've done some work in pig stomachs, because if you think another major surgical issue is uh, leaks after bariatric surgery and stapling. It's other people's problem. Well, all right, but um, uh, you know, so but the point is, it's this is a tissue agnostic sealant. It's not like I'm a lung sealant. It's, I'm a sealant. Uh, I'm a lung guy, so you know that was my first target, but I think it's a wide range. We're yeah. actually working with some of our neurosurgeons for a dural leak, actually, as well. So, so actually, I'll, I'm just two quick questions. The, the first one is more technical or more detailed, and the, the second one is more general. So, so as 82 cells turn into 81 cells, they actually start to express a whole bunch of matrix proteins themselves. And so, yeah. from your perspective of studying the matrix that makes these cells repair or don't repair. Do you think those cells are trying to create a more hospitable environment for themselves and is there a relationship? So, yeah, that's a great question. So what one thing I did not touch upon is that uh, cells remodel the matrix uh, on an ongoing basis, right? And they want to create a home that they, uh, you know, their, their, their bedroom or whatever that they recognize. So we're figuring out the different ways of trying to figure that out because we, we can provide the matrix, right? The decelerized lung or whatever flavor and the cells are going to sit in that and start to change it. So part of it is what technical approaches do you use to uh, follow that? And so we're learning uh, new ways of doing that. And so, but it's it's a very important uh, point. And, and sort of the second question is just more general. It's like, so if I'm a fellow in this audience, right? How and and I'm thinking about like you know the next the rest of my career. So what do you think the likelihood that we're going to see stem cell therapies or uh, you know, ex vivo uh, lung engineering approaches to treat patients in, in, in like that, that lifetime? Well, I think certainly in our lifetime, right? But, but I think uh, th that's a broad based question because it's not one size fits all, right? So if you're trying to grow new lungs, uh, there's been a lot of progress and there have been some implantation studies of homegrown lungs, if you will. And uh, so bit by bit by bit. So I, you know, conservatively five years or so. And we, but we said that. 10 years ago, all right? So each iterative step is like peeling an onion away, but we'll get there eventually, right? That's number one. Number two, uh, I'm gonna to talk tomorrow at the uh, investigators meeting, or lab meeting, what have you, about uh, executable stromal cells, so cell-based therapies. And uh, that's a totally different aspect of stem cell therapy. Uh, and we're very close uh, to that, all right? And I'll talk about in particular, the studies in ARDS and COVID ARDS. And, and so, yeah, so, so I, if I were a fellow or a postdoc or a grad student, I would say this is a really good time to get into this, these areas. The questions? I'll ask for Jim. Can you, um, can you use your model um, and then get TJ Beta to, to use it as a disease model of the lung that you could test therapeutics in? 
So could you, can you make the, the lung become fibrotic by, by adding in different factors to, you know, that, that's to really interesting um, because, uh, you know, let me twist that a little bit to PCLS, precision cut lung slice, that I learned uh, a lot today that uh, those PCLS change even over five days in terms of amount of collagen that they found in the expression of genes. So we've not even begun to explore that. But I think these, we can keep these hydrogels going for weeks, months. And so um, the answer is absolutely. So wide open field for all those fellows and postdocs and grad students looking because to do something. The mouse models, you always get dinged because you know that your mouse model is not recapitulating human yeah. disease right. appropriately. So, so we think this is a better mouse trap, actually. Hi, Dr. Weiss. Um, it was a very interesting presentation, especially the foray into avian lung research at the end. Um, but I was wondering, this sort of delves into the hypothetical, but if the patient in need of a transplant, um, utilizing the method where a scaffold is implanted with the patient's own cells, has, um, if the cause of the need for a transplant is more rooted in genetics, like something that's innate within themselves, would right. that cause any issues recurring issues with the transplanted uh well, I mean so, so I mean if you think about where where do the genetic diseases that get transplanted uh, CF and alpha one right uh, to pick the two more common if you will so we, we haven't done anything to uh essentially stop the liver from not making alpha one uh etc so I think it would be the same result as if they had an allogeneic transplant on immunosuppression that uh, over time, the uh, uh, again the alpha one's going to come back and get you CF. Um, you know, with all the CFTR modulators, and the fact that the CF lung transplants are double lung, right? That um, I, I I don't think we would have any uh, disadvantage compared to a uh, allogeneic uh, unmatched lung. I don't think we'd have a particular advantage uh, in that situation. But go back to the root cause. Not enough lungs to go around, and you know, acute and chronic rejection, bronchiolitis obliterans, um, uh, is where I think we'll be able to make the mark. Any other questions? All right. So, thank you very much for that amazing talk. I thought that was like a very magnificent future. Thank you.